Greetings and welcome. My name is Dean Folkers. I serve as the Information Systems Officer for the Nebraska Department of Education and super excited uh, to be able to share with you some of the work that's been happening, some opportunities that we have moving forward as we begin sort of halfway through the month um, celebrating and or bringing awareness to what we're entitled, what's entitled K-12 Digital Equity Outreach Month. So today, we kind of have, um, we have a, a number of different uh, pieces that we're going to share with you. Ultimately, there's several people that will be presenting um, and be a part of the, the session this morning. Um, we have uh, Ron Cohn actually, um, I think is not going to be able to join us, had an, an, a family emergency uh, this morning, um, but we've got Scott Eisen from the FCC uh, that uh, will be able to We also have Amy Melander, um, who is the superintendent at Central Valley Public Schools um, that will be joining us. And then we'll hear from Evan Shea, who uh, will be sharing some of the cool resources that have been developed uh, with Education Superhighway. So today, the actual sort of agenda for the day and the flow, if you will, um, is first to kind of share a bit about what is this notion of digital equity data and the collection process and why are we doing this and where did this come from, et, et cetera. We'll kind of dig into that. Then we're gonna spotlight um, some work that's been happening in the ESU 10 area and the Central Valley Public Schools specifically, um, where they've been using sort of bits of this digital equity data to help make decisions and inform processes um, that are a part of that process. Then um, we'll hop in and we'll have uh, the home access outreach uh, playbook and action plan and some really nifty free tools that uh, will um, add hopefully significant value into districts and schools um, that are interested in utilizing those particular pieces. And then briefly touch on next steps and then of course open it up for questions. And so if there are questions at any time, pop them in the chat. We'll continue to monitor that as we move through through the process. So what is digital equity uh, data? Uh, as many of you probably have come to realize that up until March of 2020, the majority of schools, many schools, really had kind of this general sense of the percent of students with internet access at home. Kind of, yeah, well, we think there's around 90%, we think there's around this amount. And then suddenly the pandemic hit and we were in remote status and it suddenly like became instantaneously necessary to know who does and who does not have access to the internet to learn at home. And specifically um, adequate devices that were a part of that process. And so fortunately or unfortunately, um, this sort of light that was shined on the, the opportunity or the, the challenge um, really focused the equity of access um, and the, the lack from when moving from classrooms where we have in most cases fiber and a, a robust network situations into the home for students and some teachers um, created these like challenges um, and limited options that were available in the educational process. And so ultimately, the whole notion of digital equity data is what kind of arose out of this process and, and identifying what specifically is the student status um, and their access to devices and internet. And so we call that digital equity data. So why do we worry about this? Well, there's a couple of things that I wanna share with you. Um, as a part of the pandemic response and the CARES Act funding, which was the federal investment of resources, uh, the Department of Education did a survey of districts and schools and communities and educators throughout the state. And roughly 4,000 um, respondents identified that we needed to use some of these resources to enhance the technology infrastructure. That specifically a broadband, access to devices, and some of the pieces related to the technology for students and families that were a part of that. 
So that has been a, a critical priority of the department to figure out ways that we can partner, figure out ways that we bring resources and prioritize the resources that were being, uh, that were provided by the federal government um, in the best way that we possibly could. Prior to that survey and prior to the pandemic, we had been operating with some data sets that we had that ultimately identified that roughly 40,000 students in Nebraska uh, were without sufficient broadband access at home. And again, that approximate number is out there. Um, we also knew from the Future Ready profile that was submitted by districts that there were roughly 142,000 students in the public schools that were without a school issued device. And so we knew um, that um, those were big challenges prior to the pandemic. And so ultimately um, that kind of led us to continue to figure out ways that we could close this digital gap. So the next piece ultimately um, was is critical in, in helping us move from understanding that there were issues and estimates um, to finding out uh, more specifically which students do not have access in order to like provide that as an option to connect the students. And so overall, the digital equity data um, has a, a significant number of uses. Um, first and foremost, from, from the state perspective and the regional ESU perspective, it allows us to target uh, current resources, the, the federal and some state resources um, to, to target in on the specific student needs. Uh, it also um, helps us to determine the most effective connectivity solutions. We know that there are multiple ways to connect to the internet um, that are available, whether that's hotspots, um, wireless towers, um, satellites, all different types of options. And those, a combination of those particular pieces are all um, a part of the planning process. But without sort of knowing specifically whose needs and where are they located, um, it, it makes it difficult to determine the combination of those particular pieces. We also need um, specific information so that we can continue to advocate for state and federal funding. Um, to close this digital access gap. Uh, and then ultimately there's sort of a longer term research question piece that we could potentially answer, but understanding what is the true impact of home digital access on learning outcomes. Um, the Nebraska Rural Broadband Task Force did a, did a survey last summer of teachers. I think there were nearly seven-ish thousand teachers that responded and over 40% of the teachers identified that they make decisions about not providing homework, um, knowing that some of their students don't have internet at home. And so it creates um, a change in the type of learning expectations that are associated with um, the, the process and undermines, if you will, equity of access and opportunity. And the last piece, which is a most recent ad, is the expectation from the federal level that um, CARES Act, those schools um, using um, the resources from CARES Act um, have a reporting requirement. And a part of the emerging reporting requirement um, is in fact the information that is this digital equity data um, about access to devices and quality internet. So with that, um, Nebraska had the unique opportunity to connect with, a, with many other states that were in the same place, uh, working with Wisconsin, Indiana, uh, Mississippi, and other states that were attempting to um, capture and find ways that we could help school districts in this space. Um, the biggest challenges around the original data that was, was, um, was captured is that the responses were inaccurate. There was inconsistent questions. Um, the, sometimes the questions for parents were what, how many gigabytes or megabits or kilobits or do you have? And, and these types of um, technical level questions provided confusion and, and led to inaccurate responses. Um, and 
many cases there were some inefficient collection responses and processes that were a part of that process as well and which led ultimately to incomplete data sets so if we don't have the data um, to make the informed decisions or we don't know where every student is with regard to their access it makes it difficult to, to make those particular decisions so the group of states uh, working with Education Superhighway, which we'll hear a little bit more about their kind of mission, um, got together and identified what, what are the, the kind of key questions that we could answer that are generic enough, but yet specific enough to give us the information uh, around these key digital equity data pieces. Um, and those six questions essentially are, are on the screen. These are the, the kind of make up the common data elements, but there's really focused on the devices and the access pieces and then internet um, and the sufficiency of the internet access that's related to uh, the information. What we were able to do is um, work with our vendor, um, with our student information system vendors and implement in a short amount of time um, places within the student information systems to capture this data and actually connect it with advisor. And so um, we'll kind of share with you um, the process next of, of how to store and submit the data uh, that would be derived from these core common data elements. The student information systems, we um, believe make the most absolute sense as the best place to store the data. Um, it, it, it provides security around it. You can aggregate it and connect it with other data and information, specifically the student address information, which is, which is critical to know where in the mapping and opportunities of, of supports for the internet service providers. And so our staff um, worked with the student information system vendors um, and again collaborated with some of the other states uh, to help add these fields into the advisor certification process for the 2021 school year. Um, it, it, I want to sort of give a, a shout out to the SIS vendors that really stepped up. Typically our, our cycle for implementation is sometime in January, February, we identify the changes for the coming year. Um, and then we have time to work through the implementation, testing, and rollout. Um, we really didn't provide this until late May, early June, these fields for the vendors to implement. And so it shrunk the time frame, but they really stepped up. And as you can see from the screen, that essentially most all of the vendors have certified um, through our vendor certification process for the digital equity piece. And the two that are working feverishly continue to make efforts and should have those data elements available by mid-October as a part of their process. Now, ultimately this is like key because it, it gives a place to store the information, but it also then eliminates the need for an extra submission outside of the process. Um, because of the, the connection to advisor and into uh, the EdFi uh, data store that's a part of the process. So the question that often pops up then is, so are these required? Is this, when is it due? Is it a part of the fall data collection? Um, and so the, there's like this nebulous cloud around all of that. And so um, the first and foremost, um, we, we continue to sort of highly encourage the submission of the data, um, ultimately for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those reasons, and then we'll start with the, the first kind of targeted milestone, that if by November 15th, if we could do an initial run of the data to help make sure things are making sense, to, to determine potential issues, um, that helps um, the process move forward. Um, there's also this piece of the GEAR resources, which um, in the CARES Act, there's a specific fund that is the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. The governor in Nebraska has identified that the 20% of those resources, which is approximately $3.2 million, 
um, would be to provide internet supports for students um, in Nebraska. Um, the, the trick right now is, so what does that look like and who needs it? And how can we um, best most effectively use those resources to help close that gap and, and connect that? And so this data will be used in that um, space to help prioritize the resources that are a part of that. Um, we also have added this request for quote process uh, that is targeting the internet service providers in Nebraska, the vendors that provide wired and wireless connectivity into the home. And we're, we're asking them essentially, what um, is the best education-based, home-based internet pricing that you can provide? Um, and we'll be able to collect that information and display it and share it with um, the, the group as a part of this process. Um, the, there's some key pieces that are a part of that um, work um, that are um, going to be happening and focused and, and available in November as a part of this work. And so you can begin to see I'm um, capturing the, the key information about who needs access, the opportunities of who can provide access, and be able to connect this information begins to help us move forward in solving um, the problem from a data perspective. Um, so I'll have, Grace, I'll have you flip back one, back to the data reporting timeline piece. Um, the, a, a couple of other sort of nuanced pieces that are associated with this um, include the legislative session that is the long session that starts in January. Um, there will continue to be, I'm sure, questions asked about who has access and what supports do we and should we provide. Um, there's an ongoing effort to the Rural Broadband Task Force that continues to identify projects and opportunities for coordination for ensuring internet um, is available. And then I mentioned the whole CARES Act reporting process. Right now there is, in the Federal Register, proposed reporting requirements uh, that are for schools that have utilized CARES Act and CARES Act resources. And there are some key dates for reporting year one, year two, and year three. Um, and the year one reporting, the initial reporting, is proposed for January 29th of 2021. And so suddenly the question is, um, because that's not been approved yet, um, but we anticipate there's going to be something like that. And so getting back to the original question of when are, is this data required and is it due? Yes, maybe, but kind of no, sort of, is the crazy sort of response. What we're trying to do is to be thoughtful about the specific uses of the data, allowing us the time to use it, refine it, implement it, update it, and create um, sort of pain, a more of a painless, hopefully more of a painless um, experience when needing to report the data um, to the federal government on the other end. So the next slide, um, we, we saw a little bit because I started to dive deeper into describing the RFQ, but essentially uh, that is a critical sort of piece of this puzzle is to tie the vendor providers. And so we use and are thinking through this whole process of the month of action um, known as Digital Equity Month. Uh, so the reason that it's like mid-September um, and we're just now talking about Digital Equity Month is just like all of you um, that are listening in, there are a million and one things that have been happening. And so part of the balance has been how much do we put on people's plate and add into the mixture of noise um, while people are just trying to get through day to day. But at the same time, wanting to provide and take advantage of the resources and tools that have been created to help maybe ease some of the burden, um, provide some roadmap and templates and tools that are helpful and beneficial um, as a part of this process. And so that's why we, we sort of call this the month of action. We start in September, we're gonna bleed into October. It's ultimately, um, more about um, awareness of the resources and the tools that are available and the end goal and purposes of what we're attempting to accomplish 
uh, that's a part of this month of action. The key pieces that you'll hear a little bit more about are you know, sort of this pledge and this prepare and outreach. We know that there's a number of schools that have already captured this data and are using it in some way, shape, or form. Um, there are others that maybe have a majority of the data, but they need that extra little piece of getting those specific um, last few um, data um, elements. So what we're attempting to do is to create awareness and provide the tools and resources um, to help make that process more seamless. A critical part of that process, and no matter who we are and what state did piloting of all of the information, uh, the essential element of this was the importance of direct outreach. Um, it's difficult to provide an online survey to people that don't have internet to access it, number one. Um, number two, ultimately, there are consistent, um, as we described, challenges with regard to the types of data. And so ultimately, we can start with the understanding that we all just want to be heard, but we have to consider the channels of connecting uh, with parents and community members um, to help us better understand that data. And so to kind of spotlight um, an area uh, of our state that has been able to utilize this information, um, we um, have have connected, we connected with Ron Cohn and Amy Melander um, and some of the work that they've been doing pre-digital equity data and pre-outreach um, month um, to kind of help solve some of these particular pieces of the puzzle. And so I think we have um, Chris or Julie uh, or Scott um, that maybe can talk us through and Amy maybe talk us through a little bit of um, the experiences of what's been happening in ESU 10 uh, with Central Valley. Well, I could start off again. We uh, we uh, had prepared this with Ron Cohn, and uh, he wasn't able to be with us today. But I'd like at least to introduce. Uh, the area of the state that we're talking about, ESU 10, highlighted there on the map, uh, serving central Nebraska, 44 public and non-public school districts there. And uh, we're specifically zooming in to talk more about the project at Central Valley. And so I would, uh, I would again, invite either uh, Amy or Chris to, uh, or Julie to, uh, open up and uh, to talk to us about that. If there, if there are parts you'd like me to cover as well, I would be glad to, to do that. Um, maybe a little broader first, uh, that uh, Ron has been doing extensive research into uh, different technologies and um, uh, areas of bandwidth that are available to provide service to the underserved areas uh, that, that we'll highlight here. And uh, has been doing some, uh, some of that um, on the ground as well with uh, building out uh, projects to uh, provide on a pilot basis uh, internet service to places. And that is uh, something that's beginning in, uh, in Central Valley as well. Um, recognize across the state there are a lot of different solutions and not one uh, probably fits every situation, but there are a lot of variations in the, the density of populations and users. The terrain causes challenges. And uh, so the characteristics of those different technologies um, may win out in certain situations and, uh, and others required in other situations. So um, either Chris or Amy, would you like to, uh, to talk about the Central Valley Project here? This is Amy Melander, and uh, I've been working with Ron Cohn on this project and he's done most of it and what we've done is collected data from uh, people in our district that do not have good internet and um, what we could do to kind of remediate the problem I guess and um, Ron has um, been meeting with other um, vendors 
to try to come up with something that could possibly work in our area. And um, we haven't found one thing that was successful for all of the areas because of, like you said, the terrain um, issues that we have. And um, so for our district, we might just work on like one town or area at a time and um, to try to fix the problem that way. So right now at Central Valley, if our kids get um, quarantined uh, for COVID, we've opened up a remote site in the um, town of Greeley um, that they go to as a total separate building and um, they still have to come in unless they actually have COVID, then they stay home. Um, their education because so many of them, like if you do Zoom with them, you uh, Zoom on the computer, but then they have to have um, a cell phone for audio and even then it's not very good. And we're talking quite a few families um, that has little or no internet. And when you go like north of Greeley, there isn't any fiber at all in the ground um, for good internet. We're working with Applied Connective Technologies out of Elbion, Nebraska right now, um, trying to get um, something to work there. So we haven't had a lot of success so far, but we're continuing to try out different options. Terrific, Amy. So thank you very much for that. A quick question for you. Um, ultimately at the core, before you can like figure out all of these particular pieces is capturing the data and knowing that information. Were there things that you were able to experience or challenges that you had in capturing that data? or like tips and tricks in, in what you did to be able to get information to help move into this stage of figuring out the helping part? Well, when we Zoom as a staff, you know, in March um, to, you know, have meetings um, as a Central Valley staff, it was pretty apparent then, like I would write down, um, whose internet would not come through good to us, you know, at all. And so that's how some of those dots are in the country. Um, they're my teaching staff, but my teaching staff also have kids. So, you know, it works for both. And then um, like now we've had um, our um, junior varsity volleyball team um, was quarantined and um, some of the parents just said our internet's so poor that can we please find a place for them to come, you know, to so that they continue to get their education. And so um, we have to be pretty creative out here. And so the whole time um, from March to May, we did um, packets that all of those families either picked up in Wallback, Greeley, or Scotia, um, depending where you lived, because if it just would not work to um, teach it to the kids on Zoom. Excellent, thank you. And the terrain is the problem. Even if you put something high on a tower in Greeley, Wallback sits so low, you know, that they're very problematic as to how to get good internet service to the town of. And we have like a different cellular companies looking at um, various things, but there's not very many. If we haven't found any that has come up with a solution for a wall back yet, so we might fix, you know, uh, some of the stuff around Greeley and out east of Wallback. It's they don't know what they're going to do yet. Excellent. And I think as, I mean, that's a perfect segue to transition into some of the initial mapping that, that Ron was able to do um, and, and to try to identify specifically using the data and the household pieces 
um, and the access to internet and overlaying what were the providers and what were the, the, the challenges that were associated with it. And so um, taking these different data sources um, and being able to help inform the decision-making process um, was and is a great example of, of using data to help like solve problems and figure out solutions that were a part of that. And so um, it's a great example of in ingenuity, innovation um, that was happening. One of the things that we'll have a chance to see a little bit later um, is a tool that really combines this um, mapping of household data with provider data um, that Education Superhighway has provided free to schools to use. And so as they get the data, they're able to populate it and use this tool to help determine what options exist and don't exist uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. So speaking of which, let's transition to um, Evan, who is with Education Superhighway, and have um, Evan share with us um, the tips and tricks about the Home Access Outreach Playbook and some of the history of what's going on there. So Evan? Thanks, Dean, and thanks everybody else. Uh, as Dean mentioned, my name is Evan Shea. I am a senior consultant at Education Superhighway. And just a little background on us, we are a national nonprofit uh, with the mission to connect all K through 12 students across the country to high speed broadband. Uh, our focus up until 2020 uh, has been on school connectivity, but when the coronavirus pandemic hit this past spring, uh, we launched an initiative to help states uh, and districts navigate the connectivity challenges associated with this shift to remote learning. So we've been partnering <clears throat> with the Nebraska DOE to support data collection efforts, uh, and we've developed guidance, tools, and as Dean mentioned, cool resources uh, based on best practices and learnings uh, from districts across the country uh, in order to support districts with assessing home access needs uh, and determining connectivity solutions. Uh, like that mapping tool that Dean was touching on. Uh, you can check out all of this info at digitalbridgek12.org uh, to learn more about this work. Uh, and I should also call out uh, that there has never been a cost to any of the work that we do or any of the tools and resources that we've created uh, for districts now. So why, why the need to create a playbook? Uh, given the importance of this data collection, Education Superhighway developed this playbook and action plan uh, that school districts can use to do their own, uh, what we call home access needs assessment. So we understand that this is a chaotic time uh, and the Simultaneous, simultaneously, there's this really big importance of knowing which students have access to online learning. Uh, given that, we've created a lot of these resources that we'll present today that you can use as needed uh, in this data collection effort. We get that uh, every district has its own unique resourcing needs and challenges that it's facing this school year. Uh, so we wanted to make this playbook and action plan uh, to be a support system and as flexible as possible and do not want this to be a source of stress. So while broad, uh, while broad based surveying with tools like SurveyMonkey and Google Forms can be useful for estimates and percentages, our goal here is to get actionable uh, household level data so that every student can get connected. As, as Dean went over on the importance of direct outreach, uh, we've made the playbook and action plan focus heavily on leveraging uh, direct outreach methods like calling families. So in terms of the, the action plan, the playbook is a step-by-step -step guide that provides templates, tools, and resources to run successful data collection. 
uh, that are in line with uh, common best practices. Uh, it's been informed and validated by a lot of research that we've done uh, with pilot projects that we've done across the country uh, and input from experts in family engagement and large-scale outreach campaigns. So over the next few slides, uh, we'll describe the key steps and tools that make up the playbook and the intention is, uh, the intention for all this is to be something that a district leader can pick up and execute when you're ready uh, and ideally, uh, you know, a self-service. Uh, I'll have my contact information at the end uh, if you do have any questions as well. Uh, just to walk through these steps, we have pre-work, uh, so identifying your team that will be doing this outreach, uh, uh, resourcing uh, who the callers would be, uh, step two being to uh, customize communications materials both uh, before calling starts and uh, call scripts. Uh, step three being to step up or to set up the outreach tracking and data collection tool, uh, which is a really nice spreadsheet that allows you to upload uh, student names and the caller names and uh, pretty much uh, auto-generate calling assignments. Uh, step four is to schedule and train staff. Step five being to conduct outreach and collect the data, the, uh, the actual activity. And then um, uh, after all of this outreach is complete and you have the data, uh, we have a mapping tool that allows you to see what provider options are available for every uh, specific address that you've collected uh, home connectivity data for. All right, so jumping into the playbook, we have our first step of pre-work. Uh, before you get started with collecting this data, it's important to have a couple things lined up. So first, you should identify the stakeholders within the district uh, that need to either contribute to or approve of the program. So uh, people like the superintendent uh, or uh, the school board, once, that's, once that approval is secured, we recommend having representatives from your communications and SIS team join a, a working group uh, and become owners of different assignments through this campaign. You'll also want to review any previous home access data collection efforts that the district has conducted. Uh, this is essential so you can incorporate, uh, you know, learnings from those. So what worked, what didn't, uh, and which households you already have this data for uh, to limit the amount of calls that you'll have to make. So the next up is step one. Uh, the first key step in launching your data collection effort is to identify and recruit the callers uh, who will be responsible for doing outreach to families. Uh, the number of people you need to recruit uh, really just depends on the number of households that you need to contact uh, and how you will be contacting them. We've actually developed this nifty little resource calculator uh, that's linked on this presentation. Uh, that can help you determine the right number of callers based on uh, those different outputs. Once you know the number of callers that you need, uh, you can begin recruiting uh, staff or volunteers who will conduct outreach. So we've, across our uh, pilot programs uh, and best practice research, we saw that the best results uh, occur when those doing the outreach have some connection to the families and understand the local context. So uh, people like teachers or volunteers from uh, parent groups or community-based organizations work really well in order to uh, relate to the people that they're calling. Uh, you should also ensure that you can reach out to families uh, in their home language. So uh, we'll go through this on the uh, outreach tracker tool, but um, making sure that you have the student's home language uh, or the parent's primary language input into the calling assignment so that you can assign the proper callers uh, to be able to have these discussions. Um, finally, you may consider providing compensation uh, specifically for this effort uh, if district and st school staff are working overtime. 
Uh, volunteers can also be successful as long as you're providing the right tools like training and structure, uh, which we will cover later. So the next key step is customizing your communications. Uh, the materials both for your callers and uh, to prep your families uh, of this impending outreach. So to support the, the direct calling outreach to families, we've uh, created scripts and follow-up emails to capture uh, complete and accurate results in the most efficient way. And again, all of these are uh, linked in the presentation that we'll be sending out. Uh, the scripts will guide your callers through each survey question from hello to uh, thanks for this information. Uh, it's also critical to send uh, what we call ground softening communications that will notify families of the upcoming outreach efforts uh, and help them know what to expect, uh, that somebody will be calling them, that this isn't a spam call saying that they're from the district, uh, rather they'll uh, be aware that the district really needs to get this data and they're going to be calling families to do that. So we've created a, a social media toolkit here uh, as well as a, a newsletter copy language template that can uh, provide this language ahead of direct outreach. So with all of these materials and templates, you should of course feel free to customize uh, for your district and uh, local context. So next up is tracking. Um, with the callers identified and the communications materials all drafted, uh, it's time to uh, prepare for outreach. So the idea of this step is that in order to make sure you're collecting data that can be tied back to each student, you'll need to track this at a student directory level. Uh, we recommend uh, working with your SIS administrator uh, you know, the person that you pulled into this working group uh, to pull contact information of, uh, for each household that you'll be reaching out to. Uh, on this slide, we've bolded uh, the essential data fields here, uh, student name, primary parent name, phone number. Uh, you, we also recommend having that home language field filled out as well uh, so that you can make sure that you have the, the proper callers reaching out to these families. Uh, we've made a uh, simple to use uh, outreach and data entry tracking tool. It's a Google spreadsheet uh, that you can use uh, to support this step. Uh, it's linked on here and uh, we will try to do a little presentation or a little live demo. All right. I think it's showing. All right. So once you click on that link, you'll be prompted with these easy to follow steps. Uh, first, making a copy of the spreadsheet. Uh, you'll add the list of students into the All Students tab. Uh, we just have one filled out here, Harry Potter. Uh, then you'll add the list of callers to the calling assignment sheet. Um, with uh, basic guidance here. Uh, and it's really simple, just the name, email, and the language spoken. And then once you have those filled out, so all the students uh, and say, you know, you recruit 10 different callers and their uh, language that they speak, uh, you can click this generate calling assignments and it'll create individual tabs for each of the callers so that they can uh, know who they have to call and uh, upload or update information as they get it uh, uh, with their outreach. So once they're uploading this information, we have these uh, response summary tabs, which really help the like the project manager uh, who's overseeing this this outreach effort uh, have high level stats of what are these responses looking like. So. What is the device access uh, that we're learning about? 
uh, what is the internet access results um, based on the different fields that you've entered. Let me make sure that you can actually see this. This might be a little better. And then you have an outreach summary tab here uh, to see uh, how many calls have been made, uh, essentially how many people you've been able to reach from the outreach campaign. Um, and that can be refreshed as real time as calls are being made. And then uh, an ability to download this as a PDF to uh, easily share with uh, the team on progress. So I am going to switch presentation back to Grace and hopefully, or maybe she can take it back. All right, very smooth transition there, Grace. Appreciate it. All right, so uh, back into the spreadsheet or back into the presentation. Um, once you have that tracker all set up, it's time to train the callers. So uh, the last step before actually conducting outreach is to create a schedule for callers and to train the staff. Uh, training sessions will provide a really important context about the data that you're collecting. Uh, an introduction to the scripts and the tracking tool, as well as helpful tactics for getting complete and accurate information out of every conversation. Uh, we really recommend to not skip this step. Uh, it's an hour long presentation that we've actually uh, made here and uh, is available for download. Uh, it helps to really make sure everyone's on the same page um, and to uh, really set expectations for your callers and confirm logistics like uh, schedules. So now on to the final step, which is doing the outreach itself. Uh, you want to leverage the communications materials that we created back in step two to first send out a broadcast to all families. Uh, this will give context. Um, in terms of what channels to use, we really recommend whatever uh, families typically look at the most. So whether that's the Facebook page or an email notification or the school's website, uh, it's really up to you. Uh, in terms of the calling, we recommend setting up shifts or uh, specific blocks of time for your team to do the outreach. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, any more than two hours in length. And we found that the best time to reach out to parents is either on weekday evenings or uh, weekend afternoons. Um, after the broadcast, your team will start reaching out to families based on the schedule that you've established. Uh, and we've seen that uh, doing this over a, a concerted effort over a week can yield really good results. Uh, but again, it's really up to you and what time frame work makes the most sense for you and your team. Uh, and then on to the mapping tool and I'll be uh, off your screens. So what to actually do with this data? Uh, now that you've collected your uh, home connectivity data, you can, you're can you now able to see where your unconnected students are in the community. Uh, so uh, this mapping tool really bridges uh, two sides of the equation by enabling you to visualize the data that you're collecting and then also see which internet service providers can connect the students who don't have access. So once you upload a simple CSV of the data, uh, you can filter the map view by school, grade, device, uh, and internet access. So uh, you can really easily see a view of which students don't have internet uh, on the map view. Um, but that is uh, not really where, this, where the function ends on this. Uh, to help with procurement, uh, we've pulled in provi service provider data uh, so that you can see provider options for every student address. Uh, we've pulled in uh, residential broadband and LTE coverage uh, for to in case you're doing um, hotspot solutions. So as you can see here, the yellow dots represent where US Cellular or whatever uh, service provider 
uh, can serve the unconnected households. You can also download this list uh, in a really easy to use spreadsheet uh, to see, uh, essentially it'll list out every provider and then a yes, no on whether it can serve a specific address. All right, that was a ton of information. Uh, again, we'll be sending out this slide deck after the webinar, so you can download the action plan and associated resources easily. Uh, we know there is a lot, go, a lot going on right now uh, and that all of your district landscapes are unique. Uh, so this action plan is an attempt to be a support system uh, for your team and we're here to clarify any questions that you have along the way. So I have a link here if you need to schedule a 30 minute call uh, as you're going through these steps. And now Dean is going to walk through the next steps. Great, thank you, Evan. Uh, so hopefully you were able to see that there's a, a number of resources that um, as I called them cool, uh, that are intended to be provided as, as resources and tools. And, and ultimately, this isn't like a prescriptive, you have to do this, 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 this before it's accurate or before it's complete. These are just tools and um, best practice approaches, uh, depending upon the size of your district and the context. And so ultimately, as a part of that, um, the next steps, are kind of a sequence of, of options or opportunities. First is take the pledge. And so as a part of Digital Equity Month, um, the notion of capturing the districts and schools that are committed to be a part of this process of digital equity, um, it, it basically is your sort of ticket into the resources. And so it creates um, that, that mechanism. Um, and then of course, assembling the team um, and, and thinking through what this looks like, um, for some districts, it is very simple. You know exactly who the people are. Um, you've got a narrower group of um, students you need to capture. For other districts, it's a bit more of a larger task. And so we totally understand that. But ultimately, the processes themselves um, create um, at least tools and resources to help manage and organize. Do the training, um, conduct the outreach campaign, um, and then ultimately record, report, and map your data. So recording the data into your student information system will automatically provide it to the advisor piece. So the reporting part is kind of taken care of as a part of that. Um, and then mapping your data. And so you were able to see the tools, the original work that Ron um, was able to do using a couple of different applications manually. Um, the, the tool that Evan shared essentially brings those two together. Um, and so you just populate as a district with your district data and it, and it takes advantage of those particular resources. Um, and then ultimately as a part of this process, and I mentioned the request for quote, um, the goal as a part of that displaying information about the education-based internet home pricing um, would be a part of that, that process as well. And so being able to find the services and the options for internet um, is a piece of this puzzle uh, that, that would be available to districts moving forward. So with that, uh, we are open for any questions, um, any comments or reactions that you all may have uh, to the resources uh, that were presented today. Um, in the discussion around this work. Hi, Dean, it's Grace. I'm just gonna go through a few of the questions that came up and I'll read them out loud. And um, if folks wanna continue to pop things in, I'll, I'll just read them out. So uh, the first is from Melissa and she says, I think another important question is, how many devices are accessing the internet at home? Uh, there were issues with multiple students online at a time, in addition to parents trying to work from home. Yes, um, this is um, a very good question. And I think it is a piece of capturing the data in that 
in that space and being able to tie the number of students within the same household. Um, we've we've been trying to think through what are the mechanisms or what are the minimums from a broadband perspective um, to ensure that if there are multiple students and teachers within the school or within the, the home, what are the demands on that? And uh, continue to work with vendors to think through what uh, minimums might there be for ensuring um, that work is, is, or that is available. One of the minimums that we've at least put in right now in the request for quotes is um, the preferred is at least five megabits um, per second of internet broadband per person in the household, um, both up and down. And so that is sort of one of the preferred pieces that we've identified as options. We know that that's in some cases very challenging and so in some parts of the, the, the state, but that type of information will continue to help us move forward. All right. Um, there was a question, you know, I think Amy talked to this a bit, but just maybe quickly reviewing again, how did Central Valley get the data for each student? And then um, same question, same person, if a family does not send us the data, are, are we obligated to get it from them somehow? So the first part of that question, I'll let Amy um, share where where they got the original data. We um, sent out text messages um, to the people, and then we also um, sent out um, messages on our um, beacon, our school notification um, for the parents to call in and give the secretaries all the information that we needed because it's hard to get a hold of parents sometimes during the day. So. Yes, very good. So the second part of that question is if a parent refuses to provide the information, um, ultimately there's not any sort of law compelling them to provide the information. And so that is just, um, I think one of the, the data fields in the mapping tool as an example is unknown or not provided. Um, and so that is the mechanism around that. A key, a key piece of then that is going to be to figure out and mitigate um, the challenges that are associated with connectivity. And so, so I don't know if that like danced around that answer. Ultimately it's, you can't require um, that it's submitted, but at the same time, it's sort of the effort of providing educational support and services that is the reason for the information. So I don't know if that's helpful. And Dean, I'll just add that I think um, kind of the impetus for doing some of this webinar with sharing out the resources around direct outreach is that this is what we're seeing, you know, across the country, right? The surveys are only getting you so far. And part of that is because it's hard to reach these families that don't have access with these broad um, survey sort of outreach mechanisms. And hence why we're really trying to concentrate an effort on doing the direct, um, direct to family, you know, whether it's calling or as Amy mentioned, text, getting to them to see if we can understand and then support them. And these are the ones that are kind of harder to reach. Um, so a couple more, a lot of questions coming in. Is this survey required uh, to apply for GEARS funding? And then also how do districts access the GEARS funding? So two good, two good questions. So um, the, there's, it, there's some nuances to this. So the GEAR resources are, um, have been identified by the governor to help provide support for devices and internet. And we have utilized the digital learning profiling plan that districts submitted and school, um, non-public schools this summer as the initial data source for identifying the device pieces. And so, um, We've got some information that will be coming out from ESUCC, um, the Educational Service Unit Coordinating Council on the device sides um, of that puzzle for those that identified needs. Um, on the internet piece, um, 
So the question, is it required? So ultimately, in order for us to know who would be eligible to access those resources, essentially who needs the resources to help with internet, then this is the data that we would be using to help identify that. So indirectly, I guess you could say that this is um, a part of the GEAR um, decision-making process of identifying who would be eligible for those particular resources. Um, other, than, other than that, there's really not like a, an application for GEAR resources. We use the digital learning profile to identify the device needs, um, and we're using this information to help us determine supports for the internet side of the resources that were targeted for those funds. Great. There's another question about funding that's kind of similar. I think you've pretty much answered it, but in case, um, are there any funds available to the schools after they identify the needs? So you did talk about gear. Um, I don't know if there's other funding streams, so just wanted to call that one out as well. Yeah, right now that is um, the primary resources, but um, when we have like real of the need and demands, um, if those resources cover that demand, um, it allows us then to add for other state and federal resources. Um, we continue to work through um, other channels to address some of the um, rules and regulations with FCC and E-rate. Um, there continues to be discussions around other kinds of funding opportunities for supporting schools. All of those particular pieces, we don't know yet what that's going to play out to be. But we do know that at the core of making decisions on any one of those um, funding sources is having the data. And so that's essentially another kind of use case of helping us um, and for our purpose for why we continue to move um, down this path. Great, so we just have a couple questions left. Time check that we're a little bit over the hour here. So obviously if folks have to run, they should feel free to do so. If you want to stick around and hear the answers to these last few questions, uh, please do that. There's a question about, do we just do this one time a year or do we need to update changes as families move or as they get new devices? So it's a, it's a great question. Um, ultimately, um, we sort of visualize that after this initial run, that it'll just become a part of routines of registration, um, and information that comes as students come in and out, these are data fields that we capture. Um, because of the integration with, um, with Advisor, um, it creates an opportunity for the, the, the changes, if there are changes during the year, for that data to continue to be updated automatically through the Advisor um, connection. So, so there's not like a, a drop dead, Date as far as this is when it will be used. If there were a time period where we like took snapshots of data for decision making or reporting purposes, those dates would be um, identified and announced. Um, so I, I I hope that answers your question, Jill. I don't know if there's something else you might add. No, not really. Um... Obviously, the advisor will continue to be open to accepting the data. I think the one thing districts would need to remember is that this isn't just about us getting the data. It is also about you having the most up-to-date data in case something like the pandemic happens again so that you're ready to go at that point in time. Right. Uh, that's a good point, Jill. So let's see, we have a lot more questions about funding. Um, this is from Tom. Can you elaborate on the CARES Act ESSER funds and their applicability to student home infrastructure? Yeah, so, um, so it's a great, great question. And we have some resources on what is eligible for the use of the ESSER funds. So for those that are not familiar, ESSER, is another fund under CARES, and it is the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Resources. Um, through a formula um, 
there were $59 million provided to school districts uh, that were a part of that, that process. And so there are um, a very few constraints on the uses of those funds. Um, and those are on, and we can make sure that you have those, but um, on the NDE website, if you Google CARES Act or ESSER funds, there's a whole um, raft of resources on the specific uses of those particular funds. And so that um, I know it has been a, a source of funds that some districts have made use of um, to provide supports, whether it be devices or, or internet, home internet access. Great, that was a great question. Um, how does the $40 million from the broadband fund fed COVID money fit into this plan? That might be the same. That might be referring to ESSER, I don't know. No, so that's yet another um, set of resources that the governor um, targeted for um, broadband implementation. And so um, primarily the focus of those resources um, were working with the Department of Economic Development and some of our smaller to mid-sized communities in Nebraska to help build out their fiber um, and internet broadband connections uh, within those particular communities. I think there are some resources about who was competitively involved and, and that we can maybe provide a link to off of the launchnebraska.com website. Um, launchne.com um, is where we have a, a section around technology and we'll be continuing to update resources and tools and frequently asked questions as a part of this. That sounds good. And maybe when we do some follow-ups too, we can we can kind of summarize uh, some of these funding related questions. There's a couple more just to kind of clarify. I think people are just curious and want to make sure they get this. So um, someone's saying, so the digital equity data survey needs to be completed and submitted to advisor by November 15th to be eligible for the gear resourcing. So that's a great question. So, um, so we've not made that the declaration date. Um, what we're shooting for is that as a target. And so our first run of the data would be then, um, would be November 15th. Um, if at that time we see that there's only 10% of the districts that have been able to do that, then we'll sort of evaluate where we are in the decision-making process. But ultimately we need to, we've not set a date um, for um, determining the prioritization of those resources. We have um, kind of a clock that's ticking with regard to the obligation of those funds um, by May of 2021. Um, and so that would be, we're looking at November 15th as our initial run to determine where are we. If we're almost all the way there um, by then, then we can make some decisions and move quicker. Um, as a part of the supports related to that. If we're not, and it's just not humanly possible, um, then we'll continue to evaluate the, the timing of that. So that's maybe, unfortunately, a kind of a hedgy answer, um, but essentially November 15th is a date that we targeted as an initial run to determine where we are, um, and then decisions about what dates um, and timeframes will be provided after that time. Okay, great. So we had a similar question from Wade, which I think you just answered. Um, I think you've also answered this. So there's a lot of questions about whether this is a requirement for state reporting that will be reported by advisor. Is that correct? I think you've just clarified that it's not a not a requirement per se, but you guys are encouraging this. Um, yeah. All right, let's hit one yeah. more question. Oh, go ahead. Let me just um, to double whammy clarify. So right now it is not a, a federal or state requirement to submit this data. It is highly encouraged so that we can inform the investment priorities of gear resources and other funds. However, um, we know there are some proposed rules that are around the federal reporting for CARES Act. So every district that uses ESSER dollars will re be required to report um, the information to the federal government. The proposed 
required reporting requirements do include this information. And the first time the proposed date of reporting that is January 29th of 2021. And so ultimately, we can't say today that it's required because there isn't the federal adoption of the rule. Um, it's under kind of public comment right now. Um, but what we can do is the more that we prepare is when some version of this, if not exactly this version, is enacted, we will be in a position to make that reporting very simple or much more simpler than trying to recreate data that we didn't collect. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dean. I think there's a couple more funding questions and it, it feels like a hot topic. So I wonder if maybe some stuff should be sent out in a follow up. There are questions about what are the deadlines for each of these funding pots. So for spending the $16 million of gears, the 40 million with broadband, the 6.5 million with your NDE money you kept from COVID. Um, I think there was one other question that was about a slightly different topic. I wonder, because we're almost 15 minutes over, if we just hit that question and then Dean, do you think maybe sending out some follow-up info about funding might make sense? Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree. Okay, great. So we'll do that. And then the last question uh, is about any recommendations to manage a collective effort bringing together multiple stakeholders for a regional solution. Um, for example, partnership MOUs, group leads, yeah, no, that's terrific, terrific question. Um, and it, it's sort of informally been e emerging um, as we've worked with the Educational Service Unit Coordinating Council and some of the key leaders in, um, in the ESUs, um, Ron Cohn being one of those. Um, the, the critical opportunity for us to make sure that we engage the expertise from the regions and the vendor partners within the regions to identify what are the different strategies and approaches. And so as we continue to sort of think through what are the possibilities of that, it always kept coming back to, well, what's the data and who needs access and where do they live? Um, and so, so ultimately the short answer is yes, that is absolutely a part of the strategy and, and, and thinking through this. And, um, but a key part of this and amplifying even more for us to move forward with those pieces, a consistent uh, data um, capturing of that information will enable those particular partnerships to flourish. Great, so we're, we're 15 minutes after, um, there's still a lot of folks who have stuck around, so thank you for everybody's engagement and questions. Um, again, we will be sending out this deck. I know a lot of information was shared so you can you know, have access to that and the links and all the resources to go explore on your own and see which pieces are useful to you. Uh, so we'll send out the deck and the recording, hopefully in the next day or so, and then look out for more information coming from NDE about funding and, and some more details about how this all fits together. So um, thanks everybody again for spending an hour of your time with us today and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.